Hi everyone and welcome to our next video cast. Today we're going to be talking about the other senses that we haven't already covered. So that includes smell, taste, touch, and then our kinesthetic and vestibular sense as well. So we're going to start with the chemical senses. We call them chemical senses because they work with chemicals. So both smell and taste use chemicals either in the air or use chemicals that come um, in food solutions that are then broken down by the saliva as opposed to light waves or sound waves like vision and hearing. So, some facts about smell. Uh, mammals have receptors for 10,000 different odors, okay? Uh, remember also about smell. Smell does not go through the thalamus. Um, and we talked about from an evolutionary perspective why that may happen, that it's, you know, one of the oldest senses. Um, moms can actually pick out their child's smell over a stranger's, and siblings actually don't like each other's smell. And they find that, or they think this may be related to like an evolutionary way to prevent incest. And women overall uh, have a better sense of smell than men. And women are also better because they have this better sense at detecting the smell between men and women, like being able to, to tell if the shirt was worn by a male or female. So how does smell actually work, right? So inside, all the way back at your nose, right? The odor, I, need you, I want you to write down these little steps here, right? The odor goes through the nose, right? And up to the nose and it binds to receptors, okay? And these receptors, they're right here, right? They have little teeny hair cells at the bottom. They're called olfactory receptors. That's the name, right? And the olfactory receptors actually live in the olfactory epithelium. So if you had to compare it to vision, it would be like, this would be like the retina or the cochlea, right? It's where the receptor cells live. And the receptor cells, in terms of smell, are called olfactory receptor cells. Very simple. Not a new name to learn. So, the, they, once they get an odor, right, once they get a smell, they uh, activate and they send the message up here, right? And then all of the different axons converge in um, a place called the olfactory nerve, right? The olfactory nerve is kind of like the auditory nerve or the uh, occipital nerve that it, you know, it goes, in, it takes it from the sense into the brain. And the olfactory nerve actually uh, is, starts inside the olfactory bulb. And this olfactory bulb, if you look at it from a bigger perspective, is right back here. Right. So if you see the, you know, it travels up this way, right, you smell it, and then it interacts here, and then it heads to the brain. Okay, our next sense is gustation, which is also known as taste, okay? And there's not a ton to know for taste. You definitely don't have to copy down this entire picture, but I thought I pointed out a lot of good things that I'll talk about. So the first thing is uh, the papillae, right? Papillae are actually the small bumps on the tongue, and I think they're what most of us usually thought were taste buds, but taste buds are actually usually next to or inside of the papillae. And each taste bud has between 20 and 50 taste cells in it. So if you look here, right, these are all the papillae right and then if you look here right you have the taste buds okay and the taste buds have gustatory receptor cells so they have taste cells inside of them and then here's this little taste pore and they have these little hairs and the taste the chemical goes in through there and it receives it and sends it to the brain okay so no papillae no taste buds know that the taste buds have the receptor cells it's pretty much all you need to know okay so Something about the tongue uh, that's kind of been around forever is this map, right? That we have salt, sweet in the middle or on the front, sour, bitter on the back, salty, right? But that's not actually true. What they find is that taste receptors for each of these things are located all over the tongue. And uh, you start off with about 10,000 of these receptors, and they replace themselves every two weeks. And actually what they find is that with old age, you tend to replace them less and less. So you actually, your taste gets less sensitive. So you might like something that you didn't like as a kid. You might like it as an adult because you have less sensitive taste. Um, they've discovered recently a fifth taste to add to the sweet, salty, bitter, sour. And this fifth taste is called umami. And it is uh, kind of a savory taste. They thought in the beginning that maybe it was the same as, as um, salt, but they actually found that when they were doing in tests that salt and umami were actually different. And about 72% of people in the study that I was looking at could detect the umami. Um, it's like a savory taste, and it's also, it's also used in a seasoning or a chemical called MSG that they put in food that makes it taste really good, but it's actually really bad for you and makes your stomach lining bleed and all kinds of other crazy things. Um, spicy food, like spicy is not a taste quality. So spicy food um, actually uses a chemical called capsaicin, and this activates heat receptors. It like opens up the heat receptors in your on your tongue, which then why, that's why we call spicy food hot. And those heat receptors then perceive that opening as pain. So spicy food is actually hurting your tongue, right? Kind of interesting. 
taste is genetic, and they find that 25% of people are what they call super tasters. So they have more taste buds for bitter flavors, okay? About 50 of us are average, and then another 50% are, you know, low tasters. And really what's interesting about super tasters is they tend to dislike things like diet soda and substitute sugars, but actually they, um, they eat less green vegetables, so they're not as healthy in that way. But then, of course, there's a good advantage to, like I said, they drink less diet soda, they don't like substitute sugar, and they also drink less alcohol. And we also find that people who are super tasters, on average, tend to be a little bit thinner because they have um, more taste, so they eat less of the food to get the same taste from it. So, you see here, these are the papillae, right? And the super tasters have more papillae very close together, non-tasters, fewer papillae. Remember, in the papillae are the taste buds, then the taste receptor cells goes from there. Okay, taste and smell work together in something we call sensory interaction. So much of the taste of an onion is the odor and not, um, it should say not the taste because odor and taste make flavor, right? So if you didn't have a sense of smell, right, and uh, an onion and an apple would taste a lot alike, okay? People who lost their sense of smell, uh, either through brain damage or through birth, they have a very hard time tasting the differences in things. They can tell texture but not so much flavor. And if you see this, it's kind of hard to see what's going on here, but this is the eye, the olfactory bulb you see right here. It's like right on top. It's like right above the eye, way at the back of the nose. And then the tract goes all the way through here to the brain. And then if you see taste over there, and so they crisscross and they're right next to each other. So they're very much interconnected. All right. So the skin senses is the last group we're going to talk about. Obviously, the skin sense that we're going to focus on in the beginning is the tactile sense, that sense of touch, right? How does your sense of touch work? You don't really need to know the name of the receptors, particularly for touch. Obviously, uh, the receptor site, right, or the transduction site where the magic happens is your skin, your epidermis, right, and then your dermis, but it's your actual skin. Sometimes it's the hair as well, but it's the skin. And the receptors are obviously inside or underneath the skin, okay? So one of the senses that you feel is pressure, and pressure is caused by the intensity of the touch, okay? If you look here, it shows you what a pressure receptor, where it is in terms of like, you know, from the top to the um, bottom of your skin, or I mean, through the different layers. Um, and it's, but the pressure, like this, this sensor actually works on the number of neurons that are fired, because this is connected to a neuron, right? And then the rate at which they fire at. Both of those things influence the pressure. Another uh, skin sense that you feel is temperature, right, both warm and cold. And there's warm fibers that detect warm and cold fibers that detect cold. And actually warm fibers and cold fibers together actually make hot. And if you look here, you have a cold receptor and then you have a heat receptor. And cold receptors tend to be closer to the skin, so you tend to get colder quicker and longer than, than it takes you to get warm. Um, but what they find is interesting is that a lot of these are also activated by pressure. So we tend to think as temperature and, and touch, which we think of as pressure, interconnected. The last one that, you know, happens obviously all the time in terms of your skin sense is pain. I know we wish it didn't, but it did, right? And these are free nerve endings that send messages to the spinal cord. But what's interesting about these, if you look here, they not only send the message to the spinal cord once they're really, you know, the neurotransmitter goes up to the spinal cord and brain, but they also send that neurotransmitter, that message out locally to cause inflammation. There's two types of pain fibers that go into the spinal cord. There's A-delta fibers that are sharp pain, and these are actually myelinated. So remember that myelin sheath, so it sends the message really fast. And then there's those dull fibers, or there's the C fibers, which are dull pain, okay? And this would be like if you stubbed your toe, the immediate pain that you feel is those delta fibers, but then if it's aching for like a couple of minutes, right, it's those dull pain, those C fibers. So pain, right? Uh, these are all the different things that we know can influence pain in terms of it's not just a biological thing, right? Yes, we do have uh, endorphins, which kill pain. We have pain receptors. Pain messages go in and out of the spinal cord. But also things can influence pain like psychological influences. So how much attention are you paying to the pain, right? That's why you don't look away when they give you a shot. What do you, are you expecting it to hurt, right? Are you expecting it not to hurt? That matters a lot, right? Are you in front of others? What's the social cultural influence? Does, is this supposed to feel painful in my culture? Or do we show pain in my culture? Right? So it's not just biological. People can learn to control the amount of pain. And pain can be influenced by adding a placebo that would say like, oh, increase pain or decrease pain. People feel more or less pain even if it's just a placebo. 
So the theory we have about pain and how it works is the gate control theory. It definitely doesn't explain everything, but it's the best explanation we've got for right now. So the theory basically says that the spinal cord has these neuro has a neurological gate, so that the pain signals can be blocked uh, and stopping they can be stopped from getting to the brain. So the gate opens by the activity of pain signals. They go up the small nerve fibers, but then the gate can close by activity of large fibers. So. The brain can actually close the gate on, like, close those large fibers on its own through productions of, like, neurotrans or neurotransmitters like endorphins, right? So it's a painkiller. So you hurt yourself, the brain would produce those, and it would try to kill the pain naturally. Or if you're running, you know, you get runner's high, right? But then you can also close the gate by sending a conflicting message. So, for example, if I bump my elbow, you're supposed to rub it, right? So this conflicting message actually helps to stop, like, close the gate and control the pain. All right, so the last two you may not be so familiar with. Proprioception, also called your kinesthetic sense, is your sense of your body position and movement of your body and the body parts relative to each other. So like where are your arms in space? Are you standing up? Are you sitting down? Is your hand behind you, in front of you? Those kinds of things, okay? And they, the, the, um, like the, the cells, the receptor cells are called proprioceptors, and they actually are located in the muscles, tendons, and joints. So the transduction site are muscles, tendons, and joints. And last but not least, your ears are not just for hearing. So your vestibular sense, which is your sense of balance, which is pretty much closely tied to your sense of proprioception or kinesthetics, comes from um, the vestibular, which is a passageway between the cochlea and the semicircular canals. And what they find is that the transduction site happens in two places. So you have vestibular sacs that give you information about the head relative to the body. So like, woo, right? And then you have semicircular canals that give you information about head movements or rotation of the body, okay? If you look here, it's kind of interesting. These are the um, vestibular sacs, and if you look, they have these hair cells, but then on top, they actually have these granules of calcium, right? They're called ear stones, and they actually are on the top, and when you move, you see they move, and then this sends a message to your brain letting you know which direction you're moving in. Same thing up here in the semicircular canal, if you look, right, they have this like like gelatinish almost like solution in there, and they move when you move, letting your brain know what direction or position you're moving in. So that's all for now, AP Psychos, and remember, psychology is flipping awesome.